Hi there. I'm Michelle Class. I'm in private practice. I handle um, mostly family law. Um, I started my practice in 1999, and uh, I worked at a big firm in 1998, and then I started my practice in 99. And um, I thought that I was going to do employment law, which was what I got my <laughs> LLM in. And then I discovered the reality of employment law, which is that people don't have money <laughs> to pay for legal services when they are unemployed. And so, so I ran an ad in the Yellow Pages. And for the young people, this is paper ads. So not internet, not, <laughs> this is d dating myself a little bit. And, um, and the phone rang off the hook. Every day, I would call my colleagues in and I'd say, watch, in five minutes, the phone's gonna ring. And literally, it would ring, and it was a family law case. So of course, I um, recognized at that point that um, coming from the big firm, I wasn't gonna take the big firm clients with me, and that these were really gonna be my clients. So half-heartedly, I embraced the family law uh, cases, and lo and behold, uh, 16 years later, I'm the family law expert. Everybody calls me. I handle uh, divorces and custody and uh, child support and all those good things. Adoption is actually one of the areas that I, I really enjoy. And I handle adoptions on all aspects of the adoption. So I handle the parent who is, I have handled the, the, um, the client who is the parent who is opposing the adoption. I've represented the petitioner for the adoption as well. Um, and I've represented as a stated interest attorney the child who in that case was consenting to an adoption. So I've seen all aspects of it and it's, it's very interesting. I thought a lot of the panelists had very interesting commentary about the psychology of it and how um, when we look at the PACA, how do we um, approach it? So from a practitioner standpoint, it's very different because I have to, of course, look at what my client is interested in. So when I'm representing the parent who is opposing the adoption, often we use the PACA as a way to, um, in conjunction with a consent, we'll use it as a way to get the, um, to avoid a trial. Like if my client, I, I do have cases that are court appointed, and so in, in the context of the court appointed cases, often the parents are parents who have um, been on drugs or have mental health issues. Um, they have very challenged life. And so because of the federal statute that doesn't allow children to languish in foster care any longer, uh, they don't have a lot of time to get it together. And if it's, um, if they need therapy, um, if they need drug treatment, uh, sometimes they just can't get it together fast enough. And so we go to trial and they're facing losing a trial, an adoption trial. Um, when they have multiple children, when, when the parents have multiple children back to back, if they contest an adoption and they lose that adoption, in the next case, they go, the court has the um, discretion to go immediately to the goal of adoption or guardianship, and they don't have to consider reunification. So um, when you, I think it's when you've had three, when you've had uh, two, cho two or more children who have been adopted, when you, and this is in the District of Columbia, um, where you, um, where it was by adjudication, then the court has that discretion. I'm licensed in, by the way, I'm licensed in Maryland and, um, and DC and uh, New Jersey, although I don't practice in Jersey. And so a lot of the cases that I've had have been in uh, DC. And so the adoptions, um, when you're going through a public adoption, is very different from the private, the private world. And it is very, um, what, what did you say, uh, big and hairy and scary? It is, I mean, from both, both aspects of it. I was in an adoption trial yesterday where I represented a petitioner, and it was a case where um, this is the fourth child for the mother, and the mother had lost all three children to adoption. So the first two children she lost, um, she fought that case, and uh, the children were adopted. And then um, she had the, uh, the um, the third child, she, thank you, she consented to the adoption. And, um, and through uh, consenting to the adoption, we did a PAC agreement. So I actually represented the petitioner in, for the third child, and then that client referred me to the, the, uh, the petitioner for the fourth child. And it was very interesting because the, 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 the way we negotiated on the PACA was different. Um, the, 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 the clients were different. So the mom who, um, the adoptive mother who was the client in for, the, for the third child, 
um, she was open to some communication. So I met with the other council and we talked about the PACA. I drafted it and we included um, as a, a term that she would create a website and that she would provide photographs and, uh, and that um, she would allow um, communication if appropriate because this was a mother who had had a long-standing um, drug history and mental health, uh, untreated mental health conditions. So the, the PACA really put all the discretion though in the, um, in the, in the, in the adoptive parent. And, and by statute it does allow for that. And I find that in most cases when I'm representing um, the birth parent, that's the biggest challenge for the practitioner is that for the lawyer, for the, the parent, the, um, a lot of times in the cases where the, the parents do have a challenge, had had a challenged life, the um, adoptive parent, they, they, they give hardly anything um, in terms of contact. Uh, discretion is always with the adoptive parent. And I find that um, sometimes the parents will give up. The, the bio parent gives up. So after the adoption's over, they just they don't try. <coughs> Um, where I see the most success is when it's, um, when it's a kinship adoption, when it's a, a family member. They already have some kind of connection, and then they will continue that connection thereafter. Um, in the case that I had yesterday, um, this was the mother of the fourth child, and um, the mother had, the, 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 uh, uh, this was the petitioner for the fourth child, and the mother had um, her uh, mental health condition and her drug usage had just plummeted. She had she had gotten worse. She had already gone through 14 drug uh, treatment programs, seven inpatient, seven outpatient, and every time she would relapse. She 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 did drug testing. The only time she tested clean was when the day she would be released from the drug treatment program. The next day she's back on drugs, um, and so for that client, she wanted very little contact at all. And in fact, we didn't think we would even have had a, a PACA, but she, you know, most people don't want a trial. The trial just, it, 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 it's hard for the, um, for the petitioner as well as for the, um, the birth parent. The petitioner then is, is subjected to cross-examination, and so a lot of people don't want that. And so we did enter into a PACA, well, we didn't enter into a PACA, we offered a PACA. And that was a little different. The terms of that one included things that I've done for other clients, which is where they create an email address. It's just a, you know, a, an email address that doesn't include their name or any identifying information. And then the birth parent can provide an email address. And then they provide information. And when they're comfortable, they can move on to maybe telephone calls and um, maybe video conference and possibly meeting. But um, this, in that case, I think that it's probably going to go in the same way that many of the cases where the parents who have, when you, when you give little contact in the PACA, I think it gives little hope to the birth parent that they're going to have communication thereafter. Um, the parents that are diligent, they do try, but I, that's, that's been my experience. I also found that I use, um, we use mediation as a way to, um, to work out the terms of the PACA. So often we'll mediate, and I've done that in both private and in the uh, open adoptions, where we, we sit and we do mediation, we have a mediator, and we talk about the terms. Um, and that's very, very helpful. Um, I think that it softens the blow for the birth parent when I represent the petitioner, because the birth parent may be upset that, you know, that, they're, that they're, not they're not getting the contact that they hope. So there's a neutral person there to say, well, you know, there is some hope if you maintain your sobriety or if you present in a way that the, birth, that the adoptive parent is comfortable with. Um, there is some hope, um, as opposed to it being from the lawyer. It's just always harder coming from, from me. I've also found um, that um, one of the panelists said that, um, that the question was posed, how will your child 20 years from now feel when they find out that the adoptive parent blocked the, um, the co communication between the child and the birth parent. And I have used that as a, um, as a, a way to encourage the, um, the petitioner when I represent the birth parent to um, enter into a PACA because I do think that's significant. And, and you know, as a practitioner, I have had um, children who will call and say, I know you were the attorney for my parent. I, I, I'd like, I wanna get, I wanna have contact now. And so um, I do think that those things are important. Um, we 
also in um, in Washington, we use uh, in Washington D.C. We use casas also. Um, they're not as um, they don't have as much say in terms of um, the recommended goals. They're more um, used like a, a mentor, sort of, to um, when we have older respondents. Um, and but they are very helpful. And they and, and I've used the casa when we were working out like the terms of the pa the paca, and the the child was um, 15 or 16, I think, in that instance. Um, so some of the points that I just wanted to um, to mention is that um, they are voluntary. I mean, they're not, um, you know, no one gets forced into the PACA, but they are enforceable. So when you have a, an, um, a, a case where the judge is signing the PACA, so it's coming through um, uh, where it's court involved and the judge is signing, I mean, all adoptions obviously are court involved, but where the judge is signing the PACA as well, then the parties can't modify that PACA. It's going to be, it has to come through a judge. And so when I'm drafting the, the PACA on behalf of the petitioner, I'm very, very careful about it because it could be modified. That's the, the downswing of it. And I found that in the District of Columbia, um, the Child and Family Services Agency, they are, um, their policy now is to move towards to move towards um, adoption as opposed to guardianship. So in those cases, we know that we know that the reason why they're moving towards adoption as opposed to guardianship is because the parents come back and they try to terminate that guardianship and they bring the the custodian the custodial parent back and forth to court. So when when I'm drafting the the PACA, I'm very careful because I don't want to draft something that gives the birth parent the ability to do the same thing through the adoption, modifying that PACA. Uh, I think those are all the points that I wanted to mention. Um, that's the uh, if the child is um, is over 14, also that child um, has the ability to consent to the PACA, and I think that's also significant. Does that all right? Oh, Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you made